Hi everybody, Dr. Kat Fleece here from Central New Mexico Community College. In our last video, we're going to summarize the major functions of the integumentary system. And just as a little side note, we're having a major thunderstorm coming into New Mexico here, and you may hear a little bit of thundering in the background, which is very exciting for us. It hardly ever rains here. It's pretty obvious that the integumentary system provides good protection for us, but it does that at different levels. And so we're going to separate the protective functions in the form of chemical barriers, physical barriers, and biological barriers. There is a bit of overlap between each one of these barriers, so it's not really all that crucial for you to be able to classify whether a protection mechanism is a chemical, physical, or biological barrier. We've already addressed the fact that by means of sweating, we can thermoregulate, and by means of our hair standing up, we can trap more air and thermoregulate that way. By sweating, we um, participate in excreting and actually not just getting rid of water, which really we, is a very special fluid for us, but we do get rid of some waste products as well. So sweat does contain some waste products. Now, an important metabolic function of our integumentary system is the fact that it begins the synthesis of vitamin D. And this is because in all of the cell membranes, uh, we find cholesterol. Cholesterol is an important molecule that contrib contributes to the formation of a cell membrane. Well, when the keratinocytes cholesterol is exposed to the UV radiation of the sun, biochemical reactions occur to the cholesterol to where it begins the first steps of vitamin D synthesis. The whole process of vitamin D synthesis is not going to finish in the integumentary system, though. Uh, it's going to, the, the, basically, the, the, the molecule that is formed by the skin is going to have to go to the liver, and then the liver modifies it some more, and it is finalized in the kidneys by that I mean the functioning form of vitamin D is created by our kidneys. So our kidneys play a very important role in the creation of vitamin D as well. So what is the big deal about vitamin D? Well, without vitamin D, you cannot absorb any of the calcium that is present in your diet that you um, that you use. So therefore, when you drink plenty of milk and you eat many calcium containing products, if you do not have the right levels of vitamin D, you're not going to absorb in your small intestine most of that calcium. So we need vitamin D for absorption of calcium in the small intestine. Without it, you cannot take the calcium out of the food that you ingest it and allow it to be transported into the blood of the connective tissue that we find in the wall of the small intestine. So keep that in mind. This is the main reason for why we see vitamin D added to our milk products. We also see that there is a large... Um, amount of blood that can be stored in our skin. As you notice, when we get flushed, for instance, we turn quite red, uh, indicating that there is a way for blood to be diverted towards the surface of our body. And of course, we've learned about the sensory receptors, and our skin is definitely involved in sensation, not just for touch, so not just touch, but also we have thermoreceptors that detect changes in temperature. And let's not forget pain receptors as well. The keratin produced by our keratinocytes clearly produces a physical barrier. They, they protect us against friction. Plus, the keratinocytes are surrounded by these lipids that they uh, secrete around them, which creates a 
somewhat water resistant type of skin for us. Except that lipid soluble products are always going to be able to penetrate anything that is lipid, including our cell membranes, which of course are made up of phospholipids and proteins. So let's do a quick review here. So cell membranes are always, no matter where we are in the body, are always going to be made up of phospholipids as well as proteins to create that phospholipid bilayer. And remember, even some cholesterol in there when we mentioned that earlier. But for our discussion now, the phospholipids are important because they are going to um, make it hard too for water soluble products to pass through uh, our cell membrane. So lipids will be able to get through. And what are what are the various lipids? Well, if we look at our lipid biomolecules, they include indeed the phospholipids, but also the neutral fats, the triglycerides, they're called better. So those are your neutral fats. And then let's not forget the steroids. Steroids are lipids as well. So anything that is a steroid is going to be able to penetrate our skin cells. And which is why very often when you have a rash on your face, for instance, you might be provided with something called hydrocortisone cream because that is made up of a steroid that is uh, cortisol based or cortisone based. Many vitamins are, are um, steroids. As a matter of fact, if you'd like to know the list of vitamins that are steroids include vitamins K, A, D, and E. So you'll see that many of our lotions will have vitamin E in them and that's okay because it should be able to penetrate. Sex hormones are also uh, steroids of course which is why we can have a patch as a form of um, birth control. And then small molecules gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, they can penetrate the skin as well. And then not so great things. For instance, think of the various chemical secondary products produced by uh, poisonous plants, poison ivy, poison oak are easy to think of. Things you have in your garage such as paint thinners are very dangerous, acetone or even nail polish remover, if you use enough of it, you'll feel that the tips of your skin of your fingertips, I should say, get very funny feeling because that acetone can penetrate. Some of our heavy metals can penetrate uh, and so therefore we need to be careful with them, lead and mercury. They're dangerous because they can actually impact our nervous system. So lead-based paint is a very dangerous thing for a kid to play around with, for instance. And then all kinds of drugs, many drugs actually, are very permeable. Nicotine can penetrate our skin. Nitroglycerin, which is often given to patients who um, tend to have, who are prone to heart attacks. Uh, fentanyl, which is uh, um, basically something that is given to patients against pain, um, especially during a surgery. Uh, seasick medications, many, many medications actually have the ability to pass through cell membranes and therefore our skin as well. At the level of functioning as, bio as a biological barrier, our integumentary system, recall, contains various cells, such as our Langerhans cells, that can defend us against pathogens. They're located in the epidermis, to some extent in the dermis as well, but in the dermis we definitely have all kinds of macrophages that will fight off pathogens. And then the DNA itself in the keratinocytes it can to some extent absorb the UV radiation from the sun and uh, then convert that to heat to some extent. Bear in mind enough UV radiation and we see that our, the nuclei of our cells start to become mutated. So the DNA itself has some protective mechanisms as well. With regards to the function of thermoregulation, we've talked about how SWEP Sweat can function as evaporative cooling. 
And then let's talk a little bit about how we can thermoregulate by the body rediverting the blood. As I mentioned earlier, you, we can become flushed looking. Let's say you're working out, which means you're getting hot. Blood is by your body sent to the surface of the body and that blood carries a lot of heat. That heat can now leave the body early, easier with the help of the sweat, but also uh, that heat can just radiate, radiate off your skin to help you uh, stay cool. On the other hand, when you get cold and colder, the blood is going to be diverted away from the surface of the body towards the inner core of the body where we have our vital organs and to protect them. So we have a way, and you'll learn more about this in AMP2, for rerouting our blood. I mentioned that we can make our hair stand up, or I shouldn't say make, we. Our sympathetic nervous system helps us with um, goose, the formation of goosebumps, making our hair stand up by contracting those erector pili muscles. And of course, that's how we trap more air. Shivering is also a form of thermoregulation, but it actually is not a function of our integumentary system. That is actually done by our skeletal muscles that are contracting and relaxing very rapidly. So we talked about blood being diverted in our body or rerouted. And so this image here shows you or gives you a bit of an idea of the, the level of vascularization in our skin. We see that there are two major regions where we have <clears throat> a high amount of, of capillary beds. And that is in the papillary layer here we have, especially into these dermal papillae, we have lots of capillaries and they're collectively referred to as the papillary plexus, the papillary plexus. Plexus always referring to a network of some kind. It doesn't always have to be blood vessels. It can be nerve vessels as well, by the way. But in this, in this scenario, in this case, what we're discussing are capillary beds. And then deeper in the dermis, we have another um, collection of capillary beds, and we refer to them as the cutaneous plexus. So all these blood vessels can be controlled to where the blood either does make it to the surface of the skin or it doesn't. So here we see a nice illustration that comes out of your book that shows how blood is diverted uh, away from the surface of the skin as illustrated here in the event it's cold, right? Well, when it's rather hot outside, for instance, or the body the temperature in the room is hot, we'll see that the, the blood is diverted um, towards the skin. And so this wraps up our first organ system called the integumentary system. We started out by learning about the different layers that make up our skin organ, and that is the epidermis and dermis, together with the various cells that we find in these different layers. We then approached the second component of the integumentary system, and that is the accessory organs, namely our glands, as well as our hair follicles and the nails. We also added the sensory receptors, despite the fact that they really belong to the nervous system. And we finally wrapped everything up by summarizing the major functions of the skin. And be sure to not forget that your integumentary system, the skin, the keratinocytes, play a very crucial role in vitamin D production.